that he wrote, The, the Art and the Way. And uh, we've already sold a couple of copies of it just by my telling people what a great novel it is. It's a, a martial arts novel uh, set in uh, uh, Okinawa and also China. And uh, it's one of the best novels I've ever read, and far enough. I, I think this guy's going to be a, a very famous writer one day. Anyway, uh, please uh, welcome Robert Hunt. The <laughs> Ross sent me. <laughs> I uh, actually want to talk about uh, history a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, so I can tell you. What, you want to see? No, it's good. He's not that old. Yeah. I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I, uh, I started studying martial arts in 1964. Not as long ago as Vincey Madsen has, but. A long time. And uh, during that time, but you go through various phases of martial arts. And, uh, I never studied Wichi Ryu Karate. I studied Shotokan Karate. I studied Shito Ryu Karate. I studied Wado Ryu Karate and Goju Ryu Karate. So the other four styles of looking at martial arts, and and also studied the history of karate. And. As, when I first started studying karate, one of the first th katas that I learned was a kata called Basai Dai. This kind of ties all together. Are you familiar with Basai Dai? Yeah. You know it? I, I, I know it. Which version of Basai Dai do you know? I don't know how many versions there are. Shotokan, I mean? Yes. Yeah, Would you do it? <laughs> We're only, not going to judge you. I only know the moves. I that's all. Know. That's all we want you to know is the moves. And you don't have to be fast or strong or anything because I just want to illustrate a point. This all ties together sometimes. version of Basai Dai, that's the first kata, major kata that I ever learned in karate. I heard some beginning katas, so that's the first real kata that I ever learned. And I was told that that kata, but that Basai, in which you know, Kinawa is said Pasai, was uh, a kata that could penetrate any defense. So I thought that's a good kata. But the thing that I noticed about Basai Dai, and you notice what, he's, what he did here was, <coughs> here's how the kata goes. Step in, block. Block, block. Block, block. Block, 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 block. And, uh, it just didn't seem to me. I mean, you know, Funakoshi said that there's no first attack in karate, but I mean, there's at least a 16th attack in karate, right? You know, that's why beat the speech of the crap out of you before you get your first punch. You come here and then you finally punch, right? Then you block and you punch and you block and then you block, 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 arm break, block, block, block. <laughs> so my friends say, okay, someday somebody's going to tell me what this is all about. But there's got to be more to karate than block, 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 block. That was show I started studying a lot of Ryu Karate. I learned Basai Dai. Blah, 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 blah. I learned Shito Ryu Karate. It's my, nowadays, my wife, it's my wife Robin, by the way, my wife and I belong to the uh, Shito Ryu organization under Kumi Adamura in Southern California. You may have heard of Mr. Adamura. We're part of that organization, Shito Ryu. Well, the Shito Ryu Basai Dai is the same thing as the Wadu Ryu Basai Dai is the same thing as the Shotokan Basai Dai. They're all the same kind of and they're all block, 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 block. And for 20 years, 
for 25 years, no one told me what it was all about. And it didn't, like I say, it just didn't make sense to me. So Robin and I were visiting Japan with Mr. Demura one time way back in the 80s. And uh, we went to Mr. Demura's senpai's business. His name is Sawabe. And Mr. Sawabe was in charge of Japanese governmental security. So when American dignitaries went to Japan, it was his people that took care of them. So when Jimmy Carter went to Japan, for example, they took care of Jimmy Carter. They didn't take care of him. And he was in a building in Osaka that was a, the top floor of a skyscraper. You know, to, he was kind of an imposing, reserved guy, but he was nice. And we sat down in his office and sipped on a couple of cups of tea, and Robin and I kind of sat there. And uh, in the middle of the conversation, he pulls a book off of his desk, and he hands it to the sensei, definitely, who was no one to talk to, we were just so long. And uh, he said that this is a book of Masai Kata. I wasn't saying anything, but I speak Japanese, so I was listening to what I was saying. And he said that they put together that organization, Mr. Demers, the organization we belonged to in Japan, which is called the Itosukai. Joseph got put together a book of 12 Basai Katas. The three that I had learned were one of the 12. They were all the same kata, essentially. Called Itosu Basai because Mr. Itosu Kata. And the other 12 katas were different Basai Katas. And that kind of got me thinking a little bit about that. And I looked through the book, and, and Mr. Suwabi gave us a gift. He gave uh, <coughs> my wife one and finally gave me one inside. Basai books that we took home. Someone eventually stole mine, and so I have a big hurry when I want to look at it. I think that's a different story. Um, and in the book, what it turns out that the book is, there was a major martial arts figure in Okinawa named Bushi Matsumura, who lived in the mid 1800s to the late 1800s, died in 1890. And he had a bunch of students. And he taught Basai. And he taught Basai to all of those students. About a dozen of them. And each of those students went on and had a school. But there was only one of those students that had a major school. And his name was Itosu. And what Mr. Itosu did was he started to teach karate in schools for junior high kids. And what he did was take Bushi Matsumura's version of Basai Dai and water it down because he didn't think it was a good idea to teach 10-year-old kids to hook their fingers in other people's eyes. But he turned Basai Dai from a fighting art into a sport. This all goes on into a big, bigger look at things. What was going on in Japan at that time if you've, saw, if you've seen the movie The Last Samurai, where the last century, The Last Samurai, his real name in real life was Saigo Takamori, fought the last battle, he was the last remaining samurai in Japan in about 1868 or 1872, something like that. Japan was going through a change from a feudal culture under the Tokugawa shogunate to a modern culture under what they call the Meiji Restoration. And all the old martial arts, sword arts, all of Jujutsu, Kenjutsu, Kyujutsu, were all changing from martial arts to martial ways, or Budo. So Bujutsu, which meant the warrior's, way, the warrior's art, had become Budo. And they were emphasizing philosophical pursuits and uh, robust health and indomitable spirit and uh, those kind of things, rather than actually killing people. Because the Tokugawa's had outlawed swords. The outlawed the, the, you know, the sword fights it. So the, uh, let's, let's go back one more step back in Japanese history. When the Tokugawa's took over Japan, uh, took over Japan in the first place, if you saw the movie Shogun years ago with Richard Chamberlain, that movie was about the time that Tokugawa conquered Japan, took over, uh, uni unified Japan under his control. That was 1603. He fought a group called the Satsuma, 
so they're going to Japan and he won. In order for this, so that the Satsuma wouldn't come back and fight him, he told them to get out and conquer Okinawa, which they did. So in 1609, the Satsuma took 100 ships and 3,000 men and went down to Okinawa and conquered the country. There was no standing army, so it took them three days to conquer Okinawa. Outlawed weapons and felt the Okinawans under their thumb. And it was during that next 300 years of what we know as karate began to grow. It became karate because they needed some method of self-defense. They had no swords, they had no army. They developed the empty hand arts based on what they learned in China. And they started to use farm implements like bows and size and tongues and things like that as well. That's 1603. So that's the art of karate. 1868, major restoration. That's the way. Karate went from a fighting art to a martial way. And you can see it in Masai Dai. The combat. You do it here. So, please have You and I are going to do this together. Okay. He's going to do what was called Itosu Basai. Now, one of the other Basais in this, in this system is called Kyan Basai. Okay? Kyan was the student of Bushi Matsumura. Itosu was the student of Bushi Matsumura. They both did Basai. Itosu watered his down. Kyan did. He passed his on intact. What's the difference? They're the same kata. But what's the difference? This is going to be real slow, okay? Then I'll look after Same uh, Kamai. This Kamai, by the way, is an interesting Kamai. This, in Chinese, is done this way, right? The Kamai. And it comes from, so the story is, a secret bow among the Ming soldiers. The sign for the Ming was the half moon and the sun. And when the Ming dynasty was overthrown, the soldiers who were allegiant to the dynasty had the secret bow of going like this, this being the half moon and this being the sun, and they bowed to each other. It was kind of a secret bring back the Ming thing. This came down through uh, Okinawa Karate history because the soldiers from the Ming dynasty were the ones that passed on a lot of the martial arts in Okinawa. So they started like this, we started like this, same motion. First move. Original form was block. Stick your fingers in somebody's eye. Block. Stick your fingers in somebody's eye. If you toast to, just like a block. Forward punch. Just okay. Is is the original version of pasai die or pasai? Block jab or block throat. And they just they didn't like that idea for obvious reasons. You know what your karate teacher used for your kids either, you know to do that. <laughs> it goes on. Uh, one more thing. There's an interesting section of this cut in the middle. Where it goes here. Mm -hmm. 
Somebody teach it to me who knew all the bunka had a kata. So it's really deep. I mean, there's a lot in there, and you can see where they're talking about you can penetrate any fortress with these kind of moves. This idea that karate developed from a martial art to a martial way and then to a tournament game stuck in my head. And I learned. These old stories about the canal, about Itosu, about Kamunwechi, and about Batayoshi, and Kia, and all the stories of the things they did. And I said, you know, these stories would make an interesting book. Why didn't anyone write that book? And I kind of waited for years to see if anyone would actually write a book incorporating all these stories. And about eight years ago, I said, well, I'm going to write the book. And I call it The Art and the Way to describe that feel. And my idea was for this is to dramatize karate from its roots in 1609 now. And I did this by, it's, fic it's fictional, but it's fictional based on history. And it's based on a family in Okinawa called the Kojo who had a martial arts, which they had a hand down within the family. They don't teach outsiders until recent years. So I took that kind of idea. I took the martial arts stories. I took all the experiences we've had in the martial arts in the last 40 years. And I put together this book called The Art of the to, to try to dramatize that. I had a 10-year-old uh, student who was really precocious. His name was Nicholas. And he read the book. Most 10 year old kids don't read the book. You know, but they can. There's nothing, it's a little violence because there's nothing bad in it. But he read the book. So he'd come to class. And he said, say, I read your book. Come over last night and we talked about it. The kid talks in real adult language. He said, Oh, you know, it has some very interesting things in it. He said, You know, the thing that people don't understand, this kid's 10, right? the thing that people can, don't understand is that. We do karate for a sport, but there were people who lived and died using this thing as a martial art at one time. I mean, that's what your book talks about. You're going crazy asking about that. And I said, well, Nicholas, that was my goal of writing this book, was to dramatize karate and, and let people know that this is a real art that lived at one time. And he said, well, Sensei, you did an excellent job. <laughs> I knew I was there after he had read my book and he really liked it. So that's that's the uh, karate history in a nutshell. If you know a few points, right, if you know uh, the Tokugawa unification of Japan, the Satsuma were kicked out and sent to Okinawa. The next 300 years is just, you know, the Okinawa is trying to survive underneath the Satsuma thumb. The Meiji Restoration when the Satsuma took Japan back, essentially, that's who Saigo Takamori was in the, in the book The Last Samurai, or the movie Last Samurai, was a Satsuma. And his, if you've seen this movie, they went off to someplace else, you know, and they couldn't get out because of the warehouse, well, because he lived down in Kagoshima, Japan, and right at the tip, and it was a long way from Tokyo, and they couldn't, or Edo at the time, and they couldn't go back and forth. So, anyway, the major restoration is the place where karate becomes, goes from being karate jutsu to karate do. And of course, the Second World War is probably the third big place, the turning point of the martial arts, and that's where we learned it from people like Sensei Natsu, they were over there, I think, that day. We, uh, probably and I studied from another gentleman, his name is Dan Ivan. And Mr. Ivan, you were about 
The Strauman was in Japan in 47 with the occupying forces, and he was he got his black belts and a lot of styles back then. And he tells a lot of stories like this. Just driving is real ill, by the way, in case you know him. He's, he's been out of the hospital and he's real close to maybe his final years right this minute because they have some kind of bone disease. I'm not too sure what he has. Um, the, my journey in the martial arts then, has been a backward one. To go back to find out what the root of all of this stuff is. And learning the, the surface of it is fine for me. But I'm driven by the need to know where it came from originally. And the flow of the org. And the, what brought karate around to being the thing that all of these people do. I mean, there's five million martial artists in the country nowadays. But what is it that appeals to us and to them so much that we pursue this martial arts? And that's kind of what drove me to do this, this whole uh, book and this whole art of the way. And maybe with any luck, we have a movie in the background for the art of the way. You're all invited. In fact, you can participate. If we, if we make a movie, I'll let you know. And, uh, They'll film it here at the summer camp. <laughs> 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 uh, that for a draw. Can I, any questions? Any other questions on karate at all? Yes, sir. Um, well, how about the other cut, the Jiang and the, uh, the other cut? With, do you think Itosu changed those as well? Yes, or? he changed them all. Itosu was kind of a uh, collector of katas. And it was his goal to try to, to amalgamate all of Okinawa karate under one group, at least Shorin karate. Right? His student, Mabuni, went one step further and put all the Shorin and all the Goju together in a style called Shitoru. Yes, Mr. Itosu changed all the katas. He watered them all down for the same reason. Well, I was, he didn't water them all down. He watered most of them down. Because some of them he didn't teach in high school. You know, he just he taught the Pinons and Basadai and probably 10 or 15 katas. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones that watered down. Some of the other ones he didn't. But most of them became watered down. The Japanese made a big effort to standardize karate, you know, and uh, turn it into a sport. So they took a lot of that martial stuff out of it. Is that when they started the uh, Japanese karate? They started to develop kihon and their training? Yes. Uh, the Okinawan style Right. The Okinawans, don't do, the Okinawans don't do group training. Right. So do you think it's a function of. Do you group training in Okinawa? Do they? I, I have, it was like a private lesson. Yeah. But they have, those classes were very small. Yeah. They, they did have classes. But it's a, Five, six people. Yeah. So they did have a whole bunch of people going up and down the... So it, 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 wasn't group, it wasn't group training. It was like every student would go up in front of his teacher and go yeah. through his copy individually. It was yeah. also, I, I was the first one to start doing group training when I came back because I had so many students. Yeah. And the Okinawans came over to visit me. They went back and they started yeah. doing it on Okinawa. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the American contribution to way too. And the J Japanese came across the same problem. They wanted to teach groups of people. As a matter of fact, they wanted to teach groups of people to be in their army. That was the goal. That was why the Japanese were interested in karate in 1900, because they were ready to conquer all of Asia, and they thought that it was a good way to get in shape and teach people to fight. And they wanted to be able to teach people fast all at the same time. As a matter of fact, they rejected karate to start with. There's an interesting story here. There was two guys. Uh, one was named... Yeah. Yabu, yeah. Yabu Kensi, who went to uh, try out for the uh, Japanese army. There's another one. They went to, in, in 1901 or something, they went to try out for the Japanese army because the Japanese was conscripting everyone. And they found that these guys are in really great condition. And they said, how do you guys get in that great condition? And they said, well, we do tea, or Okinawa martial arts. Okinawa is called karate tea. In fact, they still call about the tea in a lot of cases. Uh, and they said, we do tea. And what's tea? And tea is uh, this martial art. And they were really impressed with it. Asato. Pardon me? Asato? No. Asato with a C-H. Chilton. <laughs> no. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so the Japanese wanted to conscript, wanted to then bring karate to teach their soldiers. Uh, but what they found was it took too long. It took took too long to master karate. They wanted something they could do in eight weeks. And these guys said, well, you know, no, we can eat got 20 years, you know, so they could have that. <laughs> so, well, it won't work. But what they did do, they realized the value of it. And later on, 
they uh, standardized and started with Kihon movements and big groups of people walking up and down floors so that they actually could turn it into a martial arts to teach the soldiers. And it, was, it became real, uh, the Budo thing, the samurai stuff was twisted into pre-Second World War uh, jingoism and so that they could do attack China. Yeah, that's another story. I don't know whether you know that or not, but I'll tell you because this is important to me. We teach karate, we call it empty hand. Kata and te. But it was not, so it only became empty hand in 1936. Prior to that, it was called Chinese hand. Now it's the same way, kata and te. Also pronounced tu le. And the uh, Japanese and Japanese and the Okinawans all together. There was a lot of animosity towards China because the Japanese were raping Nanking at the time. They didn't want to call a Japanese martial art by a Chinese name. So it was called Chinese hand and pronounced karate. They took the word kata, which had another Japanese meaning, which meant empty. They said that works better because it kind of has the idea of Zen and emptiness and the boo boo and all that kind of stuff. So, and they changed the, the calligraphy from Chinese hand to empty hand. So they now we know karate is empty hand. A lot of karate teachers nowadays are going back and uh, calling and writing the character with uh, Chinese. Robert, in 1965, we visited Hong Kong with Luigi, uh, uh, with Master Luigi, and Kamiyoshi, and a couple of other people. And we, uh, no one would talk to us. We were all wearing a lapel pin that had a knuckle on it with the new uh, karate on it. I had an old pin that had China hands on it. And you know, we went around to a group of, uh, of people, and they just wouldn't talk to us. They said, we know nothing about empty <laughs> hand karate. And then someone spotted my Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All of a sudden, we're best of friends. Yeah. I was wondering about that. I was, that was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about with some of your experiences with that kind of uh, Okinawa, you know, did not become a part of Japan again until 1971. I mean, I was going karate for six, eight years and never realized that Okinawa wasn't a part of Japan. It was we took it over after the Second World War. And uh, it hit in 1971, they had what was called reversion. And Okinawa went back to the vote. Okinawa was voted. So, uh, whether to stay as a protector of the United States, like Guam, or to become part of Japan, and they voted to become part of Japan. But there was a lot of argument about whether they wanted to. I have a friend whose name is Lee Gray, who does Goju-ru, and studied in the Goju-ru dojo, and was in a Goju-ru dojo in Okinawa at the time. And he remembers that all the Yudansha sitting down and taking a vote, and the vote was whether we should teach karate to the Japanese or not. They said, yeah. okay, we will. You know, that's version. There's a lot of animosity there. Things have mellowed down nowadays. You know, the world is a different place. But the karate that we do had its infancy, infancy in a different era than it is now. So we have to, if you want to understand your art, you have to look at the era that it grew up in to understand why it is what it is now. You know, there's a lot involved in this whole thing. Anything else? Any questions on the book, the uh, idea of the martial arts? Uh, if you're interested in learning one of these Basai Katas, I'd be happy to teach it to you. I really like those things. We're doing uh, weapons seminars on bow this weekend. If you're interested in running bow kata, I'm trying to pass on a, a specific bow kata called Tokumine. And if, uh, Tokumine, by the way, was a character. Tokumine was a guy uh, who in Okinawa was got into trouble with the Japanese in Okinawa. Around the turn of the century, around the same period of time, they banished him to an island. He had to go off to another island. And the martial arts instructors from Okinawa used to go down to that island and study with uh, Tokumi. They used to use a character in the book with a different name, but used that guy's character in the book and go over the island and study. It's pretty interesting guy. Um, anyway, so this Kata Tokumi no Ko, I'm trying to pass on this weekend to anybody who's interested in doing it. And if you are interested in doing that, we're going to be working on it this afternoon. It, it takes a couple of days to learn. So if you're interested in doing something like that, do with this today so you can have today and tomorrow to work with What we can do, because this is sort of a general category in which you're the team leader, but we do have a Chinese guest. And if you'd like to spend the next 20 minutes with Darren and, and introduce uh, your guest, and, and we can take this up at another time. Well, you know, I do have a question to ask, though, one. Yes, sir. You know, this on the weapons, the Okinawa weapons, they call them karate weapons? Nah, uh, not really. Well, yeah, I, I, I was just kind of thinking that was 
kind of a contradiction in terms yeah. where sclerotic means open hand weapons. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of like they call it, they actually call it kubu jutsu. Okay, so ancient martial arts. Yeah, well, I know. I just wanted to bring that up. You don't want to give me a hard time. <laughs> no, no, I just want to bring that up. Yeah, exactly. You didn't tell them that. Because they say weapons, karate yeah. weapons is kind of like a contradiction in terms. But if you use the old translation of karate, which means Chinese, Chinese hand, you got no problem yeah. with it. Yeah. Oh, that, that wouldn't be a problem. You know? <laughs>